Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the um, info session for the preservation program. Super excited to see you all here. Looking forward to your Q&A and your questions, thoughts um, a little bit later. Um, I'm going to jump right in to um, tell you a little bit about the historic preservation program and the application process and to give you a taste of, of um, you know, what we do over here and whether this might be the program for you. Um, we uh, approach historic preservation from the point of view of experimental preservation. Um, and to give you an example of what this means, I put together these two photos. So on the left is a historic ship. It's a historic uh, fireboat that sits on New York Harbor. It's from the 1930s. It's a steel boat, and it had a coating of paint to protect it. That coating was failing, and it needed a new coating to, to save it. So this involved a lot of technology, new kinds of coating systems, uh, the application of these systems, the stripping of the existing paint. But then it raised the question, how do you put the paint back on? We're used to seeing fireboats being red and white, and that pattern is the cultural pattern of emergency response. But here in this project, the preservationist, who is a graduate of the Columbia program, collaborated with an artist, Taba Auerbach, to rethink that pattern of emergency response and what does it mean today in light of sea level rise. And so she came up with this new pattern of red and white in which the waves of the ocean are actually rising. And then you can see that the line, the flotation line that normally is lower on that boat has been visually raised on the boat to give you a sense of the current rising. And so here she's reimagined the cultural pattern of red and white as emergency response to help us rethink what that means and to help us engage with the new public about contemporary issues that are urgent for us today. And so the combination of advanced technologies, material research, and aesthetic engagement is really at the heart of experimental preservation. And we want all of you to be thinking about that as you enter into the program. We are forward-looking. We are thinking about the future. We think preservation is the most exciting and most future-looking discipline in the built environment because we are really asking the question, what does the future need that we already have in the present? And how can we make sure that the future has those resources? It takes a lot of work, a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration to do that, but it is so exciting and we can really change the world. So all of you that are thinking about applying to the program, we want to hear from you about your ambitions to change the world. What, how would you like to use preservation to make the world a better place? And what are the issues that you care about? So that's, that's the say the overall ethos of our program. Let me get into the details of how we do this. We are three full-time faculty, Professor Dolcard, Professor Avrami, and myself, and a bunch of historic preservation adjuncts, all of whom have, um, real practices in the field, uh, just like we do as full-time faculty as well, but they complement our expertise um, in various ways. They're all engineers, they're architects, they are chemists, they are geologists, they are artists, uh, they are planners, they are digital um, uh, 3D scanning and artificial intelligence experts. Um, they are the architects, obviously civil engineers. So they really run the gamut and they work either in government or in private practice or at foundations. Um, our own expertise is 
really running the gamut of the various facets that are really critical to historic preservation. So Professor Dolcard is really an expert in research and historical research, really building the case for why a particular property, a building should be considered a landmark. And the government, why should the government spend its resources to protect that resource? So national register nominations, landmarking authority designations and various municipalities, and also writing history books that advocate for the preservation of different uh, historic resources. In particular, Professor Dolcart is very interested in invisible histories and making those visible, and in particular, LGBT histories. He has a tremendously successful collaboration with a number of alums on making LGBT histories visible in New York. In New York. Professor Avrami is an expert on policy and regulatory frameworks, and she brings to that a questioning of the role of existing communities within those regulatory frameworks. Are we listening to communities? How do we engage communities in the research project? And how do we take that data and inform government decisions? She thinks systematically. She thinks at the, uh, uh, at the systemic level about how do we write laws, how do we change those laws that are going to impact everything we do as preservationists. I'm an architect and an artist, uh, and I run the Preservation Technology Lab, very interested in materials. I work on a project-by-project -project basis. Uh, I work internationally and you know work on traditional landmarks like the U.S. Embassy in Norway, which we just finished, but I also work on interrogating materials and questions of authenticity, working with, uh, for example, dusts and smells and different kinds of remnants of historic buildings that might not otherwise be preserved to try to reveal the environmental entanglements of heritage and the social and political entanglements of heritage. So I do that through artistic installations and architectural interventions and traditional uh, preservation work as, um, as an architect. So um, we bring all of those skills and all of that know-how to the curriculum. The curriculum is a two-year curriculum. Now, we have an option for those of you that are working uh, and working in the tri-state area uh, to do that in four years, to essentially do part-time work, part-time study, and to do that, uh, you know, 50% study, 50% work. And so you stretch it out over four years. That is a possibility. We also have some dual degrees with every other program in our school, urban planning, architecture, or real estate development, which we encourage you to look into if you're interested. It essentially saves you time if you're a dual degree and um, obviously saves you money. Now, um, there is the opportunity to make the decision to apply to all those programs later. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't have to apply right away. You could apply to the preservation program, start in the preservation program, and during the fall semester of your first year, takes you know decide that you actually want to you know, say study architecture as well, or real estate or planning, and then you would apply during your first year, and then your second year, you would start that dual program. So our program is organized around studio. The core of the program is a studio-based curriculum. And that studio brings together four dimensions of preservation practice. We call it the slab curriculum. On the one hand, the society aspects, community, social issues. We are doing preservation for people. We got to understand those people. Laboratory, materials, materiality, the preservation technology lab, which you can see behind me. How do we, the physical anchor for preservation is so important. So we need to learn and understand building materials in their full complexity, not just as something inert sitting on a building, 
but as a process of extraction, circulation, assembly, disassembly, and waste. So that uh, engages us in all sorts of environmental and political entanglements and social questions. The other dimension of the program is archives, historical research, understanding the significance of a place through understanding how it got to us, who made it, why is it important? Um, this is really a central part of the skill sets. And of course, buildings as a reference point, building as an anchor to even intangible heritage, situated practices, social spatial relations. These are, you know, the building as a unit. But of course, we think of buildings plural, buildings as they collect into neighborhoods, into cities. In fact, what we're really interested in is the whole of the built environment. So, in the studios, you're going to be bringing together these four aspects of um, historic preservation and combining them into various hands-on projects. And um, you're going to be informed by a series of required classes that are going to give you the knowledge necessary to carry out those projects. And those are in red and blue in this um, in this graphic over here. And then all the other ones which are in, in black are elective courses. Uh, these change a little bit every year, but these are the core courses. And essentially, as you move through the program, the first semester is all required courses. But then as you move to your second semester, you have more than half of your classes are electives that you can pick and choose what you'd like. And your second year is really all free for you to pick electives as you wish. But the one class you have to do in your second semester is thesis. This is where you do what you are interested in. This is your contribution to the field of historic preservation. And that thesis involves a, um, a, a thesis class, thesis prep class, and then you're writing your own thesis. So let me dig in a little bit into uh, studio. In studio one, you're gonna be doing a lot of um, learning new methods of research. So for example, those of you that come with a history background um, might have done research in libraries, but you maybe looked at certain kinds of archives that are more like books and essays. Here, we're gonna be expanding the notion of the archive to include records and documents that you might not typically look at. Here, Professor Dolcard is actually looking at an insurance map and looking at insurance maps as a way to tell the history. There's a lot of information on the insurance maps about who lived there, what it was it built like that that is not available in other uh, in other archives. So this is very important. You're going to be expanding your uh, capacities, looking at, for example, municipal archives, census records, understanding the building and its social and political complexity over time in order to be able to understand, is this building important? Does this building something that the future really needs? If so, what can I do about it? Part of it is also going to be documenting the building physically. So you're going to be learning to get up on a ladder and take pictures and draw it up, and you're going to be making the kinds of drawings that are necessary when you get out into the profession in order to be able to establish a preservation plan, to make an intervention, to make determinations about how to treat a certain material like a, a bronze door or a stained glass window or a granite foundation and how to use that in order to also build a case about the, the status of the building and whether it, it is there's sufficient integrity there to be able to designate it or what kind of repairs need to be done. So these are all, you're gonna be learning the skills and the techniques and tools uh, of graphic and textual communication in preservation. The second semester you move on to Studio Two, you're going to be bringing all those skills to a larger group to a neighborhood, you know, in studio one, you're really working on a one building or multiple buildings, but a singular uh, entities. And then in studio two, you're looking at neighborhoods and the communities that live in them. So you're going to be learning community engaged research methods. 
At the same time, we're very focused on climate change and adaptation. This is something that is the long wedge of the future. The existing built environment is playing a much bigger role in addressing climate change. And you as preservationists need to know how to be a part of the solution. And so part of what you're going to be learning is how do I do embodied carbon calculations? How do I really account for the, the way in which an existing building can be retrofitted so that it is actually more sustainable than new construction and make that case. So that's what you're going to be learning also in Studio 2. Uh, and you, when you're going to be thinking about those materials, you're just not going to think about the materials as all of them on the building. And then I put blinders on and I don't think about anything other than the building. You're going to be thinking about routes of material transport. You're going to be thinking about the extraction of those materials. What was the land that they came from? Who were the people that lived there? How were those materials extracted? Questions of social justice, questions of environmental pollution. All of that is part of the accounting for what a building really is. We think of a building as a process, a social and material process, not as a singular uh, inert entity. So as you finish your first year, you're going to go from your first year, second year, there's going to be a summer. In that summer, we encourage you to take a um, internship. We're going to talk a little bit about some options within the school that we give you for also workshops. But as you get to your second year, you're going to be given the option to do a third studio. This is not for everybody, but we offer this option. It's a very important studio. There, the, We actually offer two studios. They're joint with planning and joint with architecture. And what they teach you is intercultural preservation, international. We actually pay for you to travel abroad. It's all funded by the school and engage with another culture and another community in the process of preservation. It's very different to look at another building culture where, for example, in Ghana, where the students just got back from last week, they use earthen materials, unbaked clays and so on. So that's very different than in the United States where we build with two by fours. Uh, their whole regulatory environment is completely different. So engaging with those building cultures is super important and understanding them, community engagement. And um, that is one aspect that you're going to be doing in that studio that is an elective studio. You can opt to take it in or, or not take it. The other option studio is preservation and architecture. And it is, again, a travel studio. These are also an intercultural exchange studio um, in which we deal with questions of design and we deal with questions of experimental preservation expression. So this year we traveled to Venice, also a very particular building culture where they use masonry and they have to build on water and they use stuccos of various sorts and very particular kinds of woods. So very, very unique kind of building culture, but a world heritage site, world renowned and facing tremendous pressure from climate change. So we've been going to Venice to study climate change adaptation of historic buildings. This is a big part of our interest. And so we are looking here at two warehouses that are part of the Navy Yard of the Venetian Empire that are empty, that have missing a roof. And the students are going to, they're in the midst right now, we just got back from Venice, um, of designing preservation projects that both preserve the building and help bring the public in and teach the public about the building. So the interpretation is done through the preservation technology itself. In the same way as I showed you in the first image, the boat is preserved with that coating, but is also reinterpreted through that new coating. So that is actually what the students are trying to do there. Some of the projects are going to be more architectural. Like for example, here we worked on the birthplace of John Jay, one of the founding fathers of the United States. 
and that's on the right. And what you can see on the left is the visitor center that was designed by one of our students. We're student, we're, we're you know imagining how a visitor might come into the building and then learn about the history of the site before they actually visit the historic home. We have a very strong interest in materials. You don't need to be a material scientist to go this route within the program. You can be any background and not have ever taken a class on materials and still be a very successful student taking technology and materials classes. We teach you everything you need to know uh, in those classes and take it from you know zero to 100. Uh, some students decide to do theses that uh, engage with the preservation of single materials. Others employ different kinds of emerging technologies, like you can see on the right. Uh, this student, Prem, was actually em engaged in how to do projections onto historic buildings that begin to reinterpret the buildings or even restore visually the building without actually having to touch the building itself. So, project, you know, very interested in new technologies, artificial intelligence, 3D scanning, projection mapping, um, you know, how to keep track of materials through blockchain technology. All those things are very interesting to, to us and things that you will discover in the Preservation Technology Lab, which is a core part of the program. Uh, it serves three purposes. It is a classroom where you'll be learning about uh, technology, preservation technology. It is a research facility where PhD students and master's students do work on their master's thesis and PhD dissertations. And it is also a, a library of materials, which you can search online in the website material order. Um, we are a unique library of materials because our materials have lived in existing buildings. They are fragments of existing buildings. Uh, and they are uh, helpful for you to learn how to identify materials and how to treat those materials. And you're going to be learning in various classes how to do that. What are the tools and techniques and methods to be able to understand, you know, am I looking at concrete or am I looking at limestone? Am I looking at terracotta or am I looking at pre pressed metal? You know, these are all really key questions that you're going to have to know because you can also think of a building as an archive. Those of you that come from a history background, you are used to going into archives and finding information about the past. We, as a program, will teach you to go out into the street and look at a building and find information about the past. You might look at the mortar of the building and be like, well, given the sand in that building, mortar, that building has got to be from the early 20th century, for example. We're going to teach you to understand how materials are processed and made. So uh, metals, for example, are very particular because they're very difficult to restore. Once they start rusting, they're, you know, they're gone, but there's ways to actually protect them. So we're gonna, you're going to be going out to manufacturing site. This is a hot dip galvanizing plant. Our metals class visits that plant uh, to help you understand you know, how much does this weigh? How do we move steel around? You know, buildings are huge. So how do we move those materials around? They're very different than artworks. So artworks you can bring into the lab. The lab has to go out into the field in order to preserve these buildings. So we're going to be teaching you about field work as well, uh, whether it is field work that is documentation through 3D scanning or whether it is field work to understand systems, building systems, engineering systems, and not only are you going to learn to identify them, you're going to learn to make them. So nothing better than getting your hands involved in order to think more deeply and critically about existing buildings. We do this competition every year with the Association of Preservation Technology in which students either design a bridge or an arch every year, and we compete with other engineering, architecture, and preservation schools um, across the country, and we've been pretty successful at winning the prize uh, multiple years. Um, 
between your first and second year, we want you to be productive. We want you to start planning for your career, start planning for your job through engagement with different uh, companies and by taking summer workshops. We have this amazing, unique program in the summer in which the school pays you to do a summer workshop. And so it, these are two, two week or four week summer workshops in which you have to apply. They're open to the entire school, but pretty much everybody that applies gets in and we do different things. So um, we, for example, one year learned 3D scanning and understanding how to map the decay of buildings to understand the environmental forces that uh, shaped the decay on those buildings and then try to reverse engineer the climate surrounding the building. So using technology to help us understand buildings as environmental sensors. Another uh, summer, we learned about casting metal and students went down to Alabama and actually designed various patterns. And we poured bronze and we poured iron and made cast iron and cast bronze. And it was so exciting and incredibly hot when we were in those furnaces. Um, we have a lot of really exciting um, moments to come together as a program, lecture series, uh, where you can actually engage with the top thinkers and practitioners in the field that we bring to Columbia for, for you to start networking with, learning from. Um, we organize major international conferences. This year, we're going to be talking about how to repair architecture schools, how to change architecture schools. And by that, we mean schools of the built environment from focusing on building new things all the time and doing like 80% of their curriculum is devoted to new and only like 20% to existing things. What would happen if we reverse that and we spend 80% of our time thinking about existing and how to change the existing, renovate it, and 20% of our time thinking about new construction. What would that mean for the professions of the built environment? What would that mean for the world? When you're at Columbia, you can be engaged in research activities, whether it is LGBT, histories, sustainability, social justice, adaptation of the existing built environment, or heritage and climate change. These are opportunities for you to work with faculty members as research assistants. You get paid a little money also to help with tuition, and you can um, you know, work on these projects that are projects that will help bring your qualifications and your capacities up uh, in terms of orienting your career. We have a tremendous um, platform to help you get a job. Sarah Grace runs a fantastic job fair, uh, gets you connected to alumni. We have the largest alumni network in the country, um, very active alumni who help you get jobs, who mentor you. We have a alumni mentorship program. We pair you up with an alum the day you come into the program so that they are like your spirit guide into the world of preservation to help you think, okay, how do I find my job? What's my role here? What, do, what can I, who should I meet to help understand how do I get a job? I always say that getting a job is a process that starts the day you start our program. We don't let you wait until you're about to graduate to start networking and looking for a job. You start looking for a job the day you come into the program because it really takes a while to network and find your find you the right fit for you. So again, we have these incredible uh, career fairs. People fly in from all over the country um, and even internationally. Our graduates are very hot commodities. People actually really look for the skills that you learn in this program. And so we've had very successful placement uh, coming out of the program uh, for both national and international students. Uh, people work both in the United States, in New York, or internationally. Uh, we are, I must say, a very international program, students and very diverse program. So students here come from every corner of the world. I mean, we've had students from 
Brazil, Mexico, uh, Chile, Indonesia, Korea, China, uh, Taiwan, um, France, Spain, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, um, you name you, you you name it. We really believe that this is a really value added to your experience because if you mix American students and international students mix together, and we really train you to be someone that can do work anywhere in the world. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, and you're going to mix with people that have different religions, different genders, different um, outlooks on life. Uh, and, and we really believe that it is important to have those dialogues and exchanges with people that are different than us and than you. So we, 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 we hope for, um, uh, you know, for those experiences for you. Um, so uh, there are lots of opportunities for you to work at Columbia should you desire, whether it is teaching assistantships, hourly positions, uh, research positions, whether it is uh, being an editor of Future Anterior Journal, um, you can apply online for those positions uh, right after your application to the program. We can talk more about that if you're interested, but let me make sure that we have time for your questions, um, which I'm sure are many. Um, so let me let me stop here and turn over to you. If you have some questions, please raise your virtual hand and I'll call on you and I'll ask you to please turn on your screen so you can uh, you can um, ask a question. So please over to you. Uh, Donna has raised her hand. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It was so helpful, actually. I just want to ask about the, um, for the international students, the acceptance rate for the English test, uh, either it's IELTS or TOEFL, is there a, um, a specific acceptance rate or degree? There, there is a minimum, yes. Um, Sarah Grace, do you remember the number? You're muted, Sarah Grace. You're still muted. Um, I'm double checking that number and I'll be able to share that with you in a little bit, hopefully before the end of the call. Yeah, I think it's online as what the minimum is. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're an international student and have done a degree in the United States already, then I believe you are exempt from that. Yep. Flora has a question. Yes. Hi. Um, I was interested in the joint um, urban planning and historic preservation degree, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about you're kind of going over like the sequence over two years um just like how that would look different or if you just like had anything else to say about like what that dual degree looks like yeah do you want to speak a little bit about it basically there is a joint thesis at the end sarah grace there are some um you start in preservation that's what we recommend you could start in planning but we suggest that you start in preservation uh, and then you move over to planning and then you're taking classes that satisfy both requirements for both degrees. Uh, and then you take the joint preservation planning studio, that option studio that we require students to take that because that's a wonderful meeting point where you're applying the skills of planning and preservation to a community engaged project in a different country. So, um, that's one of the particularities of that dual degree. And then you write a thesis that satisfies both programs. And that's where you're working with, you know, you really want to work with um, Erica Avrami, who is both a planner and a preservationist. And so she, you know, she has a PhD in planning. 
And so she can bridge and she serves as our bridge. And as I serve as a bridge to architecture. Thank you. Sarah Grace, did you want to add something to that in terms of the dual degree? Um, I think you covered most of it, but if there's any particular questions, we have some dual students, uh, one of whom is currently doing her um, thesis and have completed her uh, both years of the HP and the UP program. Um, and she can tell you a little bit more about what it's like to be a student in that program, if you're interested. Yeah, we're happy to connect you. You can all, you can just email Sarah Grace and she'll connect you with our current students. Thank you. Sure. What's your background? Mine, um, I'm doing a history degree, but I'm kind of minoring in urban planning. And then I'm also in this program at my school for GIS. Oh, great. So I kind of have yeah. those, those three things. Yeah. So I know we have a few students from Carnegie Mellon on the call. Uh, we've had some really great students from Carnegie Mellon come through the program. So welcome to all of you. Um, let's go around the room and and uh, let's hear from everyone where you're from and uh, you know what you're studying right now or what you what career you know what what program you just you're working on. Um, we do not require any particular program. It's in qualifications. You, you, any, any, um, any degree. You know, you can come to preservation with any degree. Uh, but let's go around the room, and then I can also give you some tips, some secret tips for uh, for how to apply. You know, like a successful application, if you if you'd like. So, Flora, where are you studying at the moment? Um, I studied at Florida State University, um, but I actually came to New York this summer because I was an intern for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, um, oh, great. and I was kind of doing my more GIS work um, in their planning department, so yeah. Um, are, you, are you interested in GIS then? Yes, I'm in kind of a joint master's program where I can just start taking those classes now um at my school and then I'm also pretty interested in history of science and I'm writing a thesis on kind of like the actual development of GIS like technology in like the 70s Wonderful. and 80s so I kind of feel like I have all these fragmented interests but I am very interested in like historic preservation and urban planning GIS is a central tool, digital tool for historic preservation. The second year studio is taught in relationship to a GIS class. So you take the GIS class and the studio at the same time. Um, there is a very strong focus also in the thesis on GIS. Um, we also have a whole computation program and the planning program has GIS expertise. So you can take a lot of electives to really push that uh, technology in the preservation technology lab, you know, to really, we have some of the most powerful computers in the school and you can, and what we do, which is different than what everybody else does is we develop our own data sets. So you're going to be going out into the world and developing your own GIS data sets. You're not just going to be pulling and scraping data from municipal archives or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go around the room here. So uh, Isabel is on my screen. Isabel warns. Hi, um, I'm Isabel. I just graduated from Virginia Tech with my bachelor's in architecture this May. Fabulous. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, and tell us, how did you hear about the program? Um, just online. I was looking into getting a master's in historic preservation and you guys were a program that I looked heavily into and I was very interested in what I saw. So. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for joining the call. Uh, Anissa Estrada. Hi. Um, I graduated in May from Sarah Lawrence College, but I'm living now in Mexico working for an architect. And um, he, I came here because he specializes in restoring haciendas. And so that's how I yep. kind of got interested into historical preservation. 
Fabulous. And what did you study at Sarah Lawrence again? Liberal arts. Okay. Excellent. Very good. Uh, Francisca Layton. Um, hi, I don't speak English very well, but I'm from Chile. I study, I'm, I'm working in um architecture uh, office in dedicated of uh, heritage in Valparaiso. Oh, amazing. One of my teachers at uh, an architecture school was from Valparaiso, Julian de la Fuente. Uh, and, uh, ¿Cómo se llama? Julian de la Fuente. He worked for Le um, Corbusier, no. and uh, he was one of the people involved with the creation of the Valparaiso School. And uh, his wife, Anne Pendleton, wrote a book on the Valparaiso uh, experimental architecture projects. Uh, we have students from Chile. Uh, there is also great grants from uh, tuition grants from the Chilean government that you should be aware of. So we should connect you up with Nicolás, who's currently a student in our program that um, that is from Chile. Um, so I, oh, I have that a, sounds great. Yeah, I've had a lot of back and forth with Chile and uh, been there for, for multiple projects. So you should definitely look into that. And I I saw you too in the Bellas Artes de Chile. Yeah. You did a charla in Chile. Yo la fui a ver. Ah, okay, wonderful, great, great. We're well, so glad that you're that that this is a continuation of that. Yes, that okay, is we'll that that. We'll continue the. We'll continue. We'll put you in touch with Nicolas. Let's make a note, Sarah Grace, to put Francisca in touch with Nicolas. Oh, Olivia got, Johnson. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi. Um, my name is Olivia. I graduated um, just over a year ago from Northeastern University with a bachelor's in architecture. And I've been working in Boston since at a design build firm. Okay. Very good. And how'd you hear about the program? Um, yeah, again, I was doing some research online. I grew up in New York, so I've always kind of wanted to move back to the city and have a lot of roots there. So um, it was great to hear about it. And I do actually have a question about the part-time program. Yep. So I know that it's a two-year um previous experience in the field where you're working. Um, I was curious if that is at one place or it could be at several, if I did wanna find a job in New York while I was doing the part-time program. Um, I Will you, so do you have two years of experience? Uh, yes. Okay, then it, it, it can be in multiple firms. Um, and that's a that's a great option. We've had some people take it. Uh, you can you can work um, and study at the same time. So mm -hmm. and basically we work with you to decide which classes you should take every semester, depending on your workload. And you might be on a certain project or, you know, your mm -hmm. office might say, you know, we need you here on Mondays and Thursdays, but you have free. It depends. Some 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 firms will say you can have the morning. Uh, on this day, some people say, you know, like we work with you to figure that out. Great. Thank you. And if you'd like to hear from, again, one of our current part-time students, we can put you in touch with them. We have one who's going to be finishing up um, in May. Oh, great. Thank you. Flora, did you have a follow-up question? I see your hand is up, Flora. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just didn't put it down. Okay. Well, then let's turn to Adam Becker. You're on uh, mute, Adam. I am muted. Now I'm not muted. Hello, everybody. Sorry. Um, my name is Adam. Um, I graduated uh, from Skidmore College in 2012 uh, and since then have been working various jobs. My most recent job, I've been working in e-commerce, uh, doing customer service, and uh, currently I'm the senior manager of e-commerce operations at Hodinkee, which is a company that sells wristwatches. 
Um, and I am I, at Skidmore, I studied American studies as my major. Um, and so I have a sort of like, and that's always something that I've been thinking about and wanting to sort of get back to uh, as I've gone through life. So this, uh, um, alongside that sort of like, it brings a lot of things that I'm interested in together. Um, I live in Brooklyn, um, so I'm local and I've grew up in and around the city. So I feel very attached to it. And I feel like that's something, a place where I want to be studying this. Fantastic. Well, you know, uh, preservation is a great degree to do something practical and creative with your humanities degree. Uh, and really work with the built environment and communities to have a positive impact on the world, you know? So that's really exciting that you're you're thinking about this. Great. Um, let's move to Shai Freund. Hello. Um, it's pronounced Shay, by the way. Um, Excuse me, Shay. No, it's okay. Um, uh, I am currently a fourth-year Bachelor of Architecture student at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and I have always been really interested in historic preservation of buildings and sort of the inherent value that buildings um, have. And so I've, I don't know whether I want to do a master's or not, but if I do, then this is a potential route that I'm seeking. Fantastic. Well, um, so excited that you're thinking about it. And, um, you know, as an architect, existing buildings constitute at the moment. 40% of all income that architects in America make. So I always say, if you're going to be a doctor and you're going to be looking at different diseases and you are going to be experiencing 40% of those in one area, you better learn something about it. Uh, so many architects actually only learn about that 60%. And um, But as we see more and more existing buildings are just central to the ethos of architecture. You know, people are interested, they're doing work. So learning about how to actually do it technically and also philosophically, uh, super important. And we had um, a lot of really great students from Carnegie Mellon. So we're so excited that you're here and we should put you in touch with some of our graduates from Carnegie Mellon. So you can get that, you know, get a little bit of an inside scoop, you know, um, uh, Isaac Flores. Um, hi, I'm sorry, I, I can't uh, turn on my camera. But, no problem. Um, well, I graduated in uh, January from uh, my architecture school in Quito, Ecuador. Um, oh. Since then, I was looking forward to um, any masters fitting my interest. Um, in the career, I develop a lot of uh, intervention and history related projects. So I have a pretty passion for uh, persistence and uh, all that, uh, all related with that. So that's why I'm interested in a uh, historical preservation program from the GSD, from the GSUB, sorry. <laughs> and Isaac, what is your background in? What did you study? Uh, architecture. I have my Architect. Bachelor of Architecture. Wonderful. Okay, great. Uh, Georgios. Oh, he's going to write instead of talking, so we'll turn to you a little bit later. Um, Stanley. Hi, my name is Stanley. Uh, I'm from Nigeria, and uh, I'm um, I have a bachelor's degree in history and theology from the University of Nigeria in Suka. Yes. Great, excellent. And are you calling in from Nigeria at the moment? Yes, I'm calling in from Nigeria actually. And actually, what dragged me or what drew me uh to this uh historic uh, preservation master's degrees because uh, from my undergraduate days, I've actually been a lover of conservation because uh, that should be in my finals. I was taught that uh, I had to pick an elective in conservation. It was taught by one of my uh, professors then, 
who was um oh actually she is um uh a Cambridge graduate. So uh she taught us conservation and I picked interest in conservation, preservation, and a whole lot of that. And I did some internships also in the museum where I learned uh, about a lot of uh, things about preservation, conservation of also architectural history and objects and the rest of them. Yes. Fantastic. Wow. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, Georgios has um, written in his, um, in the text, so everyone can see that, um, but he's interested in earthquakes and has met some of you know, graduates from Columbia University and professors from Columbia University. So that's really fabulous, Georgios. Thank you so much. We do have some experts on, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, retrofitting existing buildings for um, seismic questions. So uh, Professor Tim Michiels and also some um, other architects and engineers. Professor Michiels is an engineer. Uh, structural engineer, and um, and also we have a PhD student that's doing her dissertation on this very topic. So there'll be lots for you to to work on here. Um, I'm going to turn to Ye Yedong Hu. Um, Yedong wrote that. Um, He's David, he goes by David, currently senior at Beijing Foreign Studies University, majoring in modern Greek language and literature, a fan of architecture, and would love to see how I can combine it with what I have in the future. I plan to attend firstly the intro program at GSAP next summer and decide on my next step. I heard about your program on the GSAP website. Fantastic. So you're going to be doing the summer program at, at Columbia. That's really great. Um, um, now, is that the summer? Are you going to be doing the New York Paris program or are you going to be doing the summer immersion in historic preservation? Question for you. That you can uh, I'm actually considering uh, which track to pick uh, because there are four tracks, I think. Uh, the uh, real estate, uh, architecture, uh, urban planning, and historic preservation. And I'm going to do some research between them. Sorry for the background noise. Uh, and then make a final decision. Excellent. Okay. Sit on. Let us know if we can help you in any way in that in that decision making. Um, okay, Heather Workinger. Hi, I'm actually the academic advisor and faculty at um, Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. Oh, so of I'm course. Just, I'm just listening and we helped organize the program. So I just kind of wanted to check it out myself. Well, Heather, now that I have you on, deep gratitude. Thank you so much for organizing this. It's so important to us to have these bridges to Carnegie. Um, it's such a great school and and you guys are, you know, setting up students for success. And we're just so grateful that we have this bridge to your university and that uh, some of them decide to come to our program to further their studies. So thank you for your help with this. You're so welcome. Thanks for all the information. Excellent. So um, let's turn to Catalina. John Mele. I, I can't see the full name. John Melendez. Hi. Yeah, I'm Catalina John Melendez. Um, I'm actually a third year at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I don't know if I've time to go to grad school yet, but um, Heather sent out the email and I feel like I've been getting interested in historical preservation lately because I'm more excited about um, like using existing buildings rather than building new things, um, like was mentioned in the presentation. So um, yeah, thank you for the great presentation, by the way. That's how I got into preservation, because I was the same. I was interested in working with existing things and uh, rather than, than building new, it seemed to me that there were plenty of buildings already out there, you know, that we could reuse and uh, remake and rethink and that there didn't. The world didn't need another build, another new building by me, <laughs> you know? uh, but it did need a lot of rethinking. So also artists and architects, the way they approach existing buildings was very important to me. So um, 
thinking more in an experimental way about how you intervene in existing buildings. Very excited, Katarina. I hope this was helpful for you. It was, thank you. Great. And I think the last person is Dana Al-Shahiri. Al yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm from uh, based in Saudi Arabia uh, with a background of archaeology and heritage. Um, I got interested in this program because I figured out that we don't have any local conservators, uh, which is sad, but I was also interested in the program and Columbia considered one of the best universities that can provide these programs. Um, and I was hoping to apply for it. Yeah, that's it. Please do. Um, we have a lot of, well, not a lot, but we've had a number of students from Saudi um, that have come through the program, excellent students that have done really great work and um, have done exactly what you are talking about. I've, I've had the opportunity to visit Saudi on a number of occasions, and I'm really, really impressed with the changes that are happening there, the basically a huge, I mean, almost a revolution, really, in the way that the country is, is um, approaching heritage and... Um, and there is a tremendous role that women are playing in that transformation. So it is a very exciting moment. We currently, uh, we, we, we just received the Saudi Heritage Commission at, at Columbia. Um, you know, we have a lot of dialogue going and in, in how we can participate and enable and help um, some of the work, exciting work that's going on there. So we'd be very happy to have your application and we should put you in touch with, um, with some of our students, yeah, that in, in, in recent graduates from Saudi. Yes, we have a current student who we can connect you to and um, a recent graduate from two years ago as well. Yeah, and also Saudi has some 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 tuition support, I, I believe, for some students that want to study preservation. So you should look into that, Donna. Yes, yes, I'm Thanks. applying for it. Thank That's you so cool. much. Of course. Stanley has a... Um, his hand raised. Actually, it's not like a, a question. It's like an observation that I had uh, from what you've been mentioning. There are no much people that are like interested in preservation or conservation coming from Africa or Nigeria, to be precise. I think this is kind of like it shows that there is less interest in this. So I feel this is like a, like a go-to for me. Like, I think... It's kind of weird telling someone I want to go into preservation. And all the time, I've always wanted to study history and archaeology. They were like, why are you studying the dead? No, why are you trying to find out what's happened uh, in the past? All this kind of funny, funny questions. I feel like it's like an eye opener to me that uh, this should also be uh, something everyone should try to embrace, actually. Yes, just like an observation somewhat you know stanley this is a thank you for that observation and um I, I i there's so much there in what you said um you know preservation is a field that takes a certain maturity to recognize that it actually even exists you know um it's not most people don't know about it until later in life that was my case as well when you begin to realize and develop a kind of position vis-a-vis -vis the world and you realize the importance of existing things, uh, you look around and many people end up with archaeology, but archaeology looks at things that are underground and mostly dead societies. You know, preservation is about buildings that are being used by people today. So we engage with people as well. And that is a whole different methodologies is very related to archaeology we actually have a very good working relationship with the archaeology department here at columbia but we deal with living use of of buildings and existing environments but it's very common for all of us to go through our degrees and develop this interest and realize that well gee i feel kind of alone here you know because i have this interest and not a lot of people have the same interest 
but that's where you will feel, you know, at home in our program because you're going to be surrounded by people who all share your interest. And so it's like finding your people, you know, <laughs> I always say like when we all get together, you realize that we're very, you know, we're a small program. Our classes tend to be around 20 students, or sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, but around 20 students. We have just as many faculty members, you know, we're, we're very close knit group. I have a, a question, um, just kind of about any suggestions you might have for the application. And if you think it would be helpful to submit a portfolio or what do you think? So a few things about the application. Um, we're gonna really look at your application as a whole. If you have a portfolio showcasing um, either work in architecture, art, even some of your uh, writings and other ways to kind of tell us about yourself and the process by which you're um, approaching the subject matter, that's really helpful. So um, it's optional, but it is a way for, to let us know more about you. So it is encouraged. Um, another kind of um, important thing to keep in mind is your reference letters. Um, um, you'll want to make sure that at least two of those are coming from an academic setting, your professors, an advisor, someone who is really gonna to speak to you your abilities as a student. And the third is we're gonna be looking at your personal statement um, for you to tell us your interest in preservations and more about your background, as well as letting us know um, anything that might be a gap or um, something as, that's a part of your um, application package. If there was a class you didn't do as well in, or if there was a year that was rather difficult, letting us know that in that application process um, so we can understand the whole picture of your experience. So. Thank you. No worries. Sorry, my connection dropped out, everyone. I'm back. Okay. I see that we've gone on to ask questions about how to put together a successful application. Yes. So. That's great. So, yeah. Just encouraging them about the portfolio um, letters of references, as well as their personal statement. But if there's anything particular you want to add, just as a word of it. Yeah, I would, I would say, okay, I see that uh, Georgios has a question. And. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, oh. very poorly. So, hello. Okay. It might be better so if you turn off your camera because the. About... Yeah, I think the, the connection is not great. Yeah, go ahead. My question is in case we submit our portfolio, uh, for those who studied quite long ago, I studied. I graduated five years ago, um, and I've been working in the meanwhile. Uh, is it okay if we include, you know, our uh, postgraduate projects? I mean, a project from our work, from our job. Absolutely, a hundred percent. What I would Thank encourage you. you to do is to put those projects in, and then write a little paragraph that says what your role was in that project. You know, what, what did you do as part? Because professional projects are always team projects. So, you know, what was your role? And, you know, what were the questions that it raised for you in terms of preservation? You know, what, what was your thinking in that project? What, what, what questions came out of that project for you? Um, I think in general, we want you and your, think about your portfolio or your writing sample as an extension of your statement. And don't be afraid to write a little introductory paragraph in front of your writing sample or in front of your projects and your portfolio that says, I mentioned in my writing sample that I was very interested in, let's say, the authenticity of materials. Um, 
here is a project in which I encountered a difficult replacement of a material that we had to substitute with a plastic version. And it raised questions for me about how we treat materiality in preservation. And it made me more interested in how we engage this. Or here's a history paper that I wrote for a class that dealt with um, the afterlife of a building in which I was looking at how a building that was built in the 15th century was reimagined in the 20th century. And it raised questions for me about the transmission of knowledge and values over time through uh, physical artifacts. And that's why I became interested in preservation. So help us help us grasp how you are, you know, the 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 supplementary materials. Like why is these these relevant to your application? I think in your application process, the statement is very important. And you should really tell us about um the kinds of questions that you're interested in. It's not so important to know your, like, you know, a lot of people start with, well, I had this experience with my grandfather or grandmother's house, you know, um, and I became interested in preservation. But what's missing from those kinds of statements is, okay, you had this experience in your grandmother's house, but what was the questions about preservation that that experience raised for you? Because that's what we want you to investigate and research at Columbia, right? We want you, we want to know how you think about preservation. You might not know very much about preservation, but you have questions about preservation. We want to know what those questions are. You know, how do you see the connections between the material world, the world of ideas, the world of memory and value? You know, how do you think about all those things? Um, what do you bring to it? You, uh, you might have a background in customer relations. Well, you understand what people want. So you could apply those uh, skills and knowledge to understanding how do people become attached to places and doing surveys, not customer surveys, but community engaged surveys. They might raise questions about how people interact with existing places, how they tell stories about existing places. You might have had an important travel that you encountered a 2000 year old building and it was the first and oldest building you've ever seen and you understood certain things about your own life experience. So those are the kinds of things we want to know. How do you think about preservation? This is uh, really helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Um, other questions? I know we are out of time, so I don't want to hold you here longer than than we um, initially said. But I'm also available if you any of you want to, um, you know, have a, another question or two. Okay. I've also dropped my email in the chat. So if anybody has any questions as they go through this process, or if you end up visiting New York. In the coming uh, weeks and months, please just uh, send me an email and we'll be sure to um, answer those and connect with you. Right. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for making time. We're so excited that you're interested in the preservation program. We hope that you will decide to apply and we look forward to reading your applications uh, when, that, when that happens. In the meantime, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Okay. All righty. Take care. Thank you so much.